is up punks uh this is block digest orphan block uh number one and uh there is no block height because this was orphaned uh so this is pretty much just a a little short mini episode with a couple stories we couldn't squeeze into the last full episode and um we also in addition to janine have a wild chris ellis today so what's up guys hello hello yeah, so I don't, I don't really know what the hell to do here format-wise. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, six things that I think would have made that episode way too long. Uh, so uh, any any chitter-chatter or anything anybody wants to bring up before we just dive into it? I love the idea of the orphan block. I think I love what you're doing here. I think the idea is there's so much news to cover, you can't possibly cover it in one episode. So then you have like half episodes, like this is episode. What number would it be? Just add a point five at the end. I guess. I mean... Yeah, <laughs> I can't think of anything else to do. I mean, you're, you're, you're being thorough. I love it. I think it's 221.5. Welcome to 221.5, people. Let's hit it. What's the first thing on the list? So uh, this is, I think, a little bit of a development out of Iran uh, that is pushing Bitcoin much further into the geopolitical realms. Um, so they, they already last year or so um implemented an actual licensing scheme um where miners could register as a legitimate business um that was also kind of a a restriction on how much energy could be used for mining um and now president rouhani is pretty much trying to get the central bank of iran um the energy department and their communications technology ministries um to develop a cohesive strategy for mining um and specifically another part of this um is this was announced two days after a new uh bill was proposed in the parliament to require crypto exchanges to get a license from the central bank of iran and so this this to me is um they are trying to create a comprehensive regulatory framework here to allow this in the country in terms of a revenue source for them, but I think also strictly monitor and and add these types of restrictions so that it can't become a vehicle for just massive capital flight. Just uh like just get the benefits for the Iranian government and not have all those downsides they have to worry about. And I think um, you know. Their hash rate share, at least based on the uh, Bitcoin mining map um, maintained by CBCI, um, is 4% of the, the hash rate. So, Well, yeah, in relation to the uh, stuff that's going on with Hong Kong, there's a lot more people talking about uh, using Bitcoin for capital flight, which, uh, as Alex Gladstein said, is a propaganda term invented by the state to um, criminalize uh, just you know, doing with your money what people should be able to do with their money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm super I'm super interested to see what else is like a a geopolitical kind of tool and how nation states respond to it. I think this is something that we've been following a lot on this show, and also I think uh, we've been talking off air and probably will focus a lot on the way China is going to respond to the, to the existence of. Uh, uh, Bitcoin now that we have this kind of recurring theme of repatriation of supply chains in manufacturing post COVID-19. It's possible that countries might want to bring some of the manufacturing home in Northern America and in uh, Western countries in the EU. I think also in the context of Hong Kong. And I think Iran has always just been one of those uh, areas where we wanted to focus on as, as a community because it is uh, sanctioned by the US government. 
along with North Korea, along with Russia. I think all of these aforementioned nation states you always want to pay attention. Actually, when I read the story, I didn't really know what to make of it exactly because it looked as if, yes, they were, they were trying to prevent uh, capital flight. But on the other hand, um, you know, states that are ostracized by the American financial system sort of have an incentive really to uh, try to license and follow and track the, the wealth that's generated through mining and, and through crypto exchanges. So I, I wasn't really sure how to respond. And I think we should just pay attention to this as it develops. Mm -hmm. I, th I think this with a lot of other stuff is, uh, I think at this point, it's pretty safe to say that we're going to see the anti-American axis, so to say, um, really start looking to Bitcoin as an option to get around capital restrictions. I mean, we've, we've already kind of seen that play out in Venezuela, hints at it in North Korea, and the, the Russian government actually has hosting pads on a government-owned power plant um, to sell space for miners. I mean, I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that uh, that's actually going to materialize. But this next one up, I um, think this is a really interesting thing because not really any concrete details, um, but I still think there's a lot uh, for us to talk about. Um, this company, Foundation Devices, um, which I have never heard of, I have no clue who is involved with this, um, and I know nothing about this company, um, I've seen get really active on Twitter um, talking about open hardware designs um, in Bitcoin um, and kind of putting themselves out there as a, a new Bitcoin hardware company. Um, but really, there's no concrete details or any designs or, archite or architecture specifications is really nothing except a post put up discussing the importance of open hardware. And, you know, I, I, I know you probably have a lot to say on that in general, Chris, but then, you know, the larger conversation we kind of touched on earlier, uh, if you want to go into that. Yeah, I think that it's, um, I'm just looking at their Twitter account now. So it's at foundation DVCS spelt in a kind of an interesting way and uh, they've only got 287 followers the account doesn't look very old it joined in march 2020 so it's a post-covid twitter account um and the article really sort of takes a position uh on on how they believe that the the hardware wallets and hardware security should really be designed so they're coming in from from a fossil angle which is that it should be free open source we should be able to see inside of these devices not just visibility wise but i, I think they're advocating for actual uh, open source uh, hardware even pointing out the fact that you know with these uh, stm security chips that uh, in order for really for you to know if there's a vulnerability you would need to sign an nda with that company that issues it never mind where it's actually manufactured uh, namely in, in the far east um and this is goes back to the point of repatriation which we can revisit again in this segment um and of course they they also point out that if a government works uh with stm to insert a backdoor you might never even find out about it and these are all legitimate concerns i think that they they put up the the need for transparency and open source as if that, that were really uh the, the main solution to this problem of course it comes with its own set of problems if it's open source and everybody can see into it you're, you're actually increasing the, the number of people that can that can really uh, know about it and attack it and you perhaps have to be a little bit more uh, quicker on, on your responses as a security company. Uh, obscurity uh, through obscurity, um, or security through obscurity, I should say, it, that does come with certain benefits. It gives you time advantages. Um, if, if only a certain number of people know about it, if they have to be professional and apply for an NDA and have a company set up, etc., it just means that the, perhaps the only people that are going to be able to attack this device are professionals, and we want those attackers to be of a professional class, let's say. Um, having an open source hardware wallet will, of course, give you certain advantages, and we know a large number of people that can support the project, uh, perhaps more eyeballs on the device as long as you do your, your developer uh, relations properly and you, you actually run a, a proper active uh, community there on the back end but of course it gives advantage to attackers too so i don't think this is a, a binary issue i can't tell just from the, sh the small amount of information here what gearing up for but i do think that there there is lots of space uh, coming up um to, to talk about really the 
the suitability of the companies working in hardware wallets, we mostly just have two main contenders at the moment, which is Ledger and Trezor. There's, you know, there's the other devices out there as well, which, which are left, less prominent and known. But I think post Bitcoin halvening, we're going to get a lot of new people into Bitcoin who are not technical, who are going to be uh, needing better information about this. So, yeah, watch the space, I think. Uh, go go take a check, check out the article and you, you can let us know what you've the the thing that I immediately looked at, um, because you said it's not a well known company, so I looked at like one of the people we do or can look at from the article, which is the co founder slash CEO of this new company. And, and um so he also doesn't have a huge following, but he lists uh as being his credentials that he went to, he has a master's, uh, he has an MBA from Harvard Business School and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Boston University. Um, the thing that stuck out to me though is that he claims he was the COO of Obelisk Inc., which is was is or was apparently okay. the US leading cryptocurrency mining hardware producer. Uh, and then after that, he worked at uh, Nebulous, which apparently was... Uh, behind Sia and I, I, I guess that was like the um, the holding company or something for Obelisk and Sia, which if anyone remembers what Sia is, that was uh, one of the uh, storage blockchain projects, which I am not a fan of. Um, it but still maybe... is. It okay. still is. Well, at yeah. least the, they have actual hardware design experience then. Well, yeah, he does. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, you know, this is... This is kind of a really nuanced issue that I think constantly gets like turned into a binary thing in this space. You know, I, when I first started using hardware devices, I had a Trezor and I was very much uh, convinced of the, the logic, keep it 100% open source. But, you know, we have the, these architectural designs that are more and more common these days in hardware wallets where you can take that closed chip and in the way you architect the device, you effectively just make it additive security. Like even if that is broken in some way, um, that doesn't just break everything completely. That just reduces it now to the original security of just the open chip. And so I think, you know, now that we're well down the, the road of that kind of architecture being developed, I don't think that the everything open is such a binary um, thing in this type of context. And, you know, like you, you touched on, uh, Chris, I'm kind of worried about like how it's actually architected and implemented and then how that is sold to customers. Because as far as I'm concerned, this next wave up, like this market cycle is going to be a shit show of new hardware companies you know, started by who knows who, um, just selling shit to Bitcoin users because there is no way that the existing competent companies could just scale to to meet all of the demand, and both technically but just socially in terms of marketing. And so, like, that is a real big worry of mine going forward, and I really don't know how to deal with it because it's like you know, who can pay attention to all of that or assess all of that and then get all of that information circulating widely enough yeah i mean we we have a business cycle so to speak, in bitcoin in our own little micro economy i mean normally that's uh, a term that's used in uh, by financial institutions to describe uh, uh, upward and downward movement of gross domestic products right um but we have our own it, it sort of movements in uh, crypto because we have these kind of halvenings every four years and there's the there's sort of the adoption comes in waves really uh when you and i got involved i think it was around 2012 13 when you know the engineers had already entered this categories um people who knew a little bit about code but didn't necessarily code for a living you know, we were somewhat technical. Uh, and then the next wave of people were largely sort of speculators and traders. And they, of course, uh, were not oblivious to the, the issues uh, technically, but certainly were not uh, technical people. And now I think as we continuing to get more and more people into the space we're definitely outside of the range of the experts um, and perhaps they don't even know now now you're sort of entering into sort of dunning kruger territory where they don't even know what they don't know 
Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, I, I just keep thinking uh, back to the whole Citadel time traveler meme post on Reddit and the, the whole part of that story about um, governments in Africa just putting phones in everybody's hands to use Bitcoin and that homogenous device ecosystem just gets wrecked. And yeah, the, that's that's totally a possible thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's I mean, telling people to just manage their money on, on their mobile devices, which are not designed to be secure. I mean, look at how hard it's been for computer scientists to even come up with secure hardware, hardware, you know, hardware that's meant to be secure. I mean, let alone a phone which is designed to broadcast its location and share as much as possible. It's it's almost a contradiction in terms trying to secure a mobile phone. Yeah, and so like that you jump to everybody using these devices and it's like if that ecosystem doesn't check itself properly competitively, then that same type of risk exists even for the special hardware. Yeah, yeah. there was a there was an interesting point that um Nick Sabo made. I can't remember. It was in relation to one of the many, many stories about um SMS two FA being um being broken because of sim swaps and he said that you know we can't to some degree we can't really blame the uh phone companies because there was never actually a point where they accepted the responsibility for phones to be used as you know second factor you know security devices they that was never supposed to be that was never a plan and i agree with that to some extent but then again they're also still trying to promote phones being secure in other ways and that's not really holding up at the end of the day mm -hmm. yeah i guess I, I really don't have anything else to add um you guys want to move along unless you do yeah let's go con base con base yeah so this this is just a quick update um so in the last episode or two, I covered the hash rate futures that uh, FTX, um, a derivatives exchange, launched. And um, apparently, I didn't know this, um, they have an ERC-20 token, um, like the, the STO or, or whatever acronym you want to call it these days, um, to raise liquidity. And they have announced that they are using Coinbase uh, Custody International um, to handle the, the custodying of those tokens now. Um, now, based on the announcement, um, it looks like just that ERC-20 token is being custodied uh, by Coinbase for FTX. But, you know, this is a, a dynamic, I think, that traders and, and service users should really pay attention to as more of these kind of hardened custody solutions pop up that businesses are going to use. Um, pay attention to what solutions the, the business you use is using for these type of custody services, because this can very well wind up being a, a big problem in the long term if too few of these services get used by most businesses, um, that can wind up being a dangerous concentration of, of Bitcoin in a single honeypot. And yeah, that's not a good thing um, systemically. Hey, do you need a custodian for your custodian? Yeah, apparently we do. But um, yeah, so next up, um, this is actually a really interesting thing um that could lead to a legacy company who tried to dip its toes in this space getting in deep shit so i shouldn't have to explain to anybody um the two big phases of gpu consumption for mining um when they were first used for bitcoin and then um shit coins in the last couple years um well nvidia and other um graphics cards companies um, took advantage of that. Um, some even started selling units that were um, not passing quality control for actual gaming use um, for mining anyway at cheaper prices. And apparently um, through the entire period of 2017 to 2018, um, the CEO, the CFO, um, and senior vice president um, all actively misled um investors 
um, in the sense of downplaying and in and, and some meetings not even mentioning the share of their revenue growth that was due to cryptocurrency mining and actively um, misleading and trying to frame things um, to investors as if the huge spike in revenue they were seeing in 2017 was actually sustainable demand from gamers, um, you know, due to, you know, esports and just that entire scene exploding in size and becoming a real market. Um, when the reality was most of that revenue spike was due to cryptocurrency miners, which was obviously not going to be sustained demand. Um, and they have just had an amended um, lawsuit filed in California in the last few days, um, despite the original one um, being a few years old. Um, and they are going um, after NVIDIA for violation of the U.S. Exchange Act in materially misleading and misrepresenting investors. So, yeah, this is going to be uh, pretty entertaining. So these are mostly altcoin uh, miners, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously GPU mining hasn't been a thing in Bitcoin for a long, long time. So if Litecoin goes up, they should be okay and they can return to profit or what? <laughs> nope. Litecoin's uh, ASIC, if I recall correctly now. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, I think this is exactly why we still haven't seen big companies like AMD or Intel and such try to really jump into the mining sector of this space because, yeah, what company wants to have that kind of volatility in revenue and have to answer to shareholders for that? Yeah, I mean, it could just take the any incidental profits it makes as gravy and not even report on it. But I think at the moment, these are allegations, right? And we don't have a verdict. Mm -hmm. Well, pretty much the, uh, the argument being made by the shareholders is that if they had known um, the revenue spike was related to this, they probably would have sold shares um, because they would have looked at this as an overvaluation of the company with the uh, corresponding um, share price increase. And so, yeah, that I think... Yeah they have a, a pretty solid case on i see i mean because i don't know i swear that i swear that we talked didn't we even talk about them making a lot of money from selling gpus that were being used for cryptocurrency mining like was it mm -hmm. i feel like it wasn't it wasn't like a secret i think everybody in this space um at least uh saw exactly what was going on there yeah because like i mean any investor if they have money in this company and they see such a huge spike in revenue, like, are, did they really think, Oh, there's just so many more gamers who need GPUs out of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I have nothing really to say except they were probably boomers. That's age discrimination, mate. <laughs> I mean, I mean, to, to be fair, um, but, I mean, well, Cryptocurrency mining is kind of a game. It's like a digital lottery. Well, now they're selling illegal gambling tickets. Uh-oh, you just caused more problems. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, this I, I, I think that this dynamic um, is probably why we haven't seen any pre-existing tech companies get into this space and probably why we won't for a while. Because, yeah, I mean, just, just really look at this situation and just imagine the cost benefit analysis that like a CEO is going to make. Does he want to create this kind of potential shit between the company and investors for transitory gains? Ah, oh, man. Alrighty. So are we ready to quickly gloss through something that I really don't want to talk about, but feel compelled to anyway? Let's talk about Satoshi. <laughs> so, um, Ira Kleiman has filed a, uh, a motion to sanction um, Craig. And I'm just going to mostly look at the, uh, the table of contents for the most part. This was filed on the docket on the 21st of May. Um, but yeah, it, it is just a giant summary of all the different ways that he has lied, um, provably just by contradicting himself. Um, 
factual background um, in the table of contents. Wright has repeatedly lied under oath and submitted forged evidence in a failed effort to avoid trial and win this case through disp er, dispositive motions. Wright provides perjurous testimony and forged evidence in an effort to avoid compliance with court orders. Wright submitted new lies and forgeries directly to the court to avoid sanctions and to prevent the plaintiffs from proving their case. It's literally just like the perfect bullet point of like all of the lies that he has been caught into. Um, one of the more recent ones that are hilarious um, is trying to actually enter statements um, from his wife um, validating his involvement in Bitcoin and then his wife on on the witness stand um, going, I don't remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Th Wait, this he is called a her as a witness? Yep. Wow. And um, yeah, um, at this point, I don't think I need to explain to listeners why I don't give a shit about any of this. But if you're looking for really hilarious reading material over the, the week, uh, here's 25 pages of that right here uh, in the show notes for you. <laughs> well, the funniest part is that even with those 25 pages, there was still more lies that were pointed out just in the last couple of days because, you know, some early miner decided to risk their OPSEC and sign, uh, basically sign a statement um, showing that they not only controlled a bunch of the addresses that uh, fake Toshi was claiming to hold, but um, that uh, clearly they were not uh, owned by him. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like wrote 25 pages and the thing that makes the news is a uh, anonymous miner coming out of the dark to call him a fraud again yeah at, at this point this is for months in my mind it's no longer when is the good enough evidence going to appear it's when is the judge going to stop extending the benefit of the doubt to somebody a retarded child could see is lying yeah, and they, they're still trying to escape it. There's a uh, Calvin uh, Iyer claiming that, no, it's not a minor. It's a disgruntled former um, N-Chain employee who, you know, you would think would not be stupid enough if they had access to these keys um, to <laughs> attempt to just take the money. Instead, they decided to, you know... <laughs> write a statement like it's so ridiculous it's such a ridiculous theory no one's going to believe that and also i mean that makes him look like a fool that he gave some random end chain employee that he clearly didn't trust access to some extremely valuable keys um not only in terms of the bitcoin that they had access to but also in, in terms of the historical uh mysticism around them mm-hmm and I, I don't even know. Um, isn't their story still that they don't have those private keys yet? And wouldn't this new story um, show that they, in fact, do and are therefore lying about something different? Yeah, I mean, it apparently, apparently that means that the keys not only, you know, spontaneously appeared in the last couple of days, but they were given, the access was given to an N-Chain employee and the N-Chain employee <laughs> decided to to rebel against them and write a message. It's quite a interesting story. But without psyching the coins. Yeah, apparently he, you know, the employee was like, yeah, didn't, I mean, not, just to be clear, we're all making a joke out of this because this is so difficult or, or so stupid but... oh no no no! my official position is that he is satoshi for now right so like let, let's that be clear dun, silence dun, dun. dun 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 well i was just having an existential um debate in my head of whether i should just ban you from the server forever after that i think right, so it's, i so i, I either think get it's sued for, for defamation it. or i get a perma ban so the bitcoin mumble shit <laughs> that's Wait. a tough call right there why haven't I gotten a perma ban for pineapple pizza? Well, it's not quite as severe. Not quite. Close, though. Really? really close. But when I told you about the pineapple pizza, you very loudly uh, barfed. You didn't do that one. Uh, I guess Satoshi doesn't make you want to barf. I was just, it, it put me in a greater state of shock. It really did. Alrighty. In fact, it should be compounded because Satoshi said that he liked pineapple pizza. Oh, 
Oh my god, why did you do that to me? <laughs> Alrighty though. Um Yeah, so last up, um movements um out of treasure to form a, a slip um their internal version of a, a bip um for proof of utxo ownership uh for hardware wallets um doing different automated um signing operations without manual approval every time and so uh i think it's actually like two years ago um gregory sanders pointed out um, that there are kind of a few nuanced ways in an automated system like that where you could defraud somebody um, by selectively um, withholding or changing details um, about a specific input in a transaction uh, because there's really no way for a hardware device to figure out whether they own a specific input or not um, in a fully encompassing way. Um, and he proposed the idea of kind of effectively having a, a signature over um, inputs provided in, in these types of the, the biggest example is a coin join transactions to have a pretty much what you would do is you would take some information like the the script in the UTXO or something um, and then concatenate that and hash it with a key. Um, from your device. So like a special BIP32 path that isn't used for anything. And then that way, when a hardware wallet is provided a transaction, um, it could take all of the signature proofs and then check them against the, the actual private key that it has, which is a, a part of this um, proof um, construction process, um, and be able to instantly and cryptographically show these inputs are a part of my wallet and these ones are not and know which inputs to sign and um, be able to kind of um, handle that in a, in a much more accurate way. And then also, um, in addition to just the, the UTXO data as well, um, you can have a coin join coordinator have like a unique nonce that is part of this as well so that you can't have these types of things replayed in um, future coin join rounds. Um, let's say you provide a proof for something and then you end up um, failing out of the coin join round. Um, that would leave that proof open um, to play games in the future. And so they're kind of working right now um, and looking for outreach and kind of standardizing this into a slip. And um, I'm kind of torn because honestly, this is absolutely one of those things that needs to be standardized. But um, in my experience, uh, when Trezor Labs runs off and air quote standardizes things in slips, um, they tend to do so without really thinking or caring about compatibility with other hardware or other software in the space. Um, they just do it considering Trezor devices. Um, and then don't care and so i'm kind of hoping that on this one um, they don't do something that pretty much forces a incompatibility issue across different pieces of hardware because they just do this to go look at the standard we made and don't really think about anybody's products be besides their own so definitely a necessary thing but i'm kind of skeptical about how this is going to play out oh my question is, I mean, this kind of thing would be useful in a wallet that actually had coin management features. Does that mean that Trezor is going to get that? I hope so. I mean, it's like, I, I'm hoping looking at this, like I'm kind of struggling to see a way where this could be standardized. Um, and like the any kind of inefficiency in resource or implementation use um, wouldn't even be possible to make something that could cause a lot of big problems for like other devices, but you know, track record and such. And by the way, the, I mean the Trezor hardware wallet does give you coin management. Uh, it's just that their software through through the browser doesn't allow, allow that. But you kind of use it with Electrum, you get access to, to individual uh, inputs. 
Yeah, that's that's what I mean. But I I would still wish that they had some coin management stuff in their default uh, software wallet. Yeah. I remember a couple years ago, I yelled at both Trezor and Ledger people about that. And their excuse was that it was too advanced yeah. for, um, it, it, that, yeah. that's such nonsense. Like the idea that you can't walk a, a non-technical person through the idea of an output um, means that that person is too stupid to understand getting change back from cash. I don't believe there is a thing as a person that's stupid. You, you just need to take the time to walk them through it. Yeah. But yeah, I guess uh that was the last story on the docket for the first orphan block. Short and sweet show. Alright. So we got any short and sweet final thoughts for the listeners? Uh well I don't know if you saw it, but uh Vitalik made this very wordy poll about um if you had some kind of initiative. I, I'm assuming this is some hypothetical uh consensus decision that he's plotting out but he said suppose a group uh suppose 90 percent of a group surveyed supported um something and 10 percent opposed it but the 90 percent were basically a the same person who was copied using a star trek replicator 30 minutes ago uh should where whereas the remaining 10 percent were all separate individual people should the proposal be implemented and my favorite response to that was uh, you need a civil protection mechanism. I suggest proof of work. <laughs> Very kind, good. Kind of funny how every time people try to find a different solution for that, it always comes back to proof of work. Yeah. I I would say my final thought would just be to point people to uh, the response from Trezor. I think Ledger might have made one already to the rumors that were circulating over the weekend that the uh, eShop of data of their customers, including potentially personally identifiable information such as name and address, physical address, I mean, uh, was leaked. It turned out that it was a hoax, but it was uh, not looking good for a few hours there uh, over the weekend. Um, it looked as though it was possible that the personal information of customers of uh, Trezor and Ledger um, that were using various e-shop platforms and e-commerce platforms uh, had been leaked. And it perhaps just gave us pause for a moment to think about the potential vulnerabilities uh, that perhaps people haven't weighed up. And uh, So go check out Trezor's uh, blog post. It was posted yesterday, the 25th of May. And uh, perhaps think when you're ordering these uh, hardware wallets, perhaps uh, try to give an employer's address and use a pseudonym or something like that. This. I think most of these uh, vendors should uh, facilitate you in doing this and should not deny you not using your real name. Mm, that, that's good to hear. And maybe, you know, at the least, uh, vendors that weren't managing that information properly um, might actually look into how to do that now. Yeah. Or be, I mean, or, uh, or be like me and get all of your hardware wallets in them and never yeah. order anything. <laughs> yeah, that's very valid. It's valid. Well, I don't really have a, a serious final thought. Uh, all I'm going to say is that when crazy women on TV um, go say that they did a bad thing when they didn't, um, therefore it's okay for us to do a bad thing, that's not how morality and ethics work. So catch you later, Are you punks. calling me crazy? <laughs> no, Janine, not you. Uh, <laughs> catch you later, punks. Bye. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>